happy Halloween. So today I'm going to read a special story for this Halloween episode. This is the story of Hansel and Gretel by the Brothers Grimm. This was translated by Margaret Hunt in 1857 from the original translation in German by the Brothers Grimm, Jacob and Wilhelm. Hansel and Gretel Near a great forest dwelt a poor woodcutter with his wife and his two children. The boy was called Hansel and the girl Gretel. He had little to bite and to break, and when great scarcity fell on the land, he could no longer procure daily bread. Now when he thought over this at night in his bed and tossed about in his anxiety, he groaned and said to his wife, What is to become of us? How are we to feed our poor children when we no longer have anything even for ourselves? I'll tell you what, husband, answered the woman. Early tomorrow morning, we will take the children out into the forest where it is the thickest. There we will light a fire for them and give each of them one piece of bread, and then we will go to our work and leave them alone. They will not find the way home again, and we shall be rid of them. No, wife, said the man, I will not do that. How can I bear to leave my children alone in the forest? The wild animals would soon come and tear them to pieces. Oh, you fool, said she, then we must all four die of hunger. You may as well plane the planks for our coffins. And she left him no peace until he consented. But I feel very sorry for the poor children. All the same, said the man. The two children had also not been able to sleep for hunger and had heard what their stepmother had said to their father. Gretel wept bitter tears and said to Hansel, Now all is over for us. Hush, Gretel, said Hansel. Do not distress yourself. I will soon find a way to help us. And when the old folks had fallen asleep, he got up, put on his little coat, opened the door below and crept outside. The moon shone brightly, and the white pebbles which lay in front of the house glittered like real silver pennies. Hansel stooped and put as many of them in his little pocket of his little coat as he possibly could get in. Then he went back and said to Gretel, Be comforted, dear little sister, and sleep in peace. God will not forsake us. And he lay down again in his bed. When day dawned, but before the sun had risen, the woman came and awoke the two children, saying, Get up, you sluggards. We are going into the forest to fetch wood. She gave each a little piece of bread and said, There is something for your dinner, but do not eat it up before then, for you will get nothing else. Gretel took the bread under her apron as Hansel had the stones in his pocket. Then they all set out together on the way to the forest. When they had walked a short time, Hansel stood still and peeped back at the house and did so again and again. His father said, Hansel, what are you looking at there and staring behind for? Mind yourself and do not forget how to use your legs. Ah, father, said Hansel. I'm looking at my little white cat, which is sitting up on the roof and wants to say goodbye to me. The wife said, fool, that is not your little cat. That is the morning sun, which is shining on the chimneys. Hansel, however, had not been looking back at the cat, but had been constantly throwing one of the white pebble stones out of his pocket on the road. When they had reached the middle of the forest, the father said, Now, children, pile up some wood, and I will light a fire, that you may not be cold. Hansel and Gretel gathered brushwood together as high as a little hill. The brushwood was lighted, and when the flames were burning very high, the woman said, Now, children, lay yourselves down by the fire and rest. We will go into the forest and cut some wood. When we have done, we will come back and fetch you away. Hansel and Gretel sat by the fire, and when noon came, each ate a little piece of bread, and as they heard the strokes of the wood axe, they believed that their father was near. It was not, however, the axe. It was a branch which he had fashioned to a withered tree, which the wind was blowing backwards and forwards. And as they had been sitting such a long time, their eyes shut with fatigue, and they fell fast asleep. When at last they awoke, it was already dark night. Gretel began to cry and said, how are we to get out of the forest now? But Hansel comforted her and said, just wait a little until the moon has risen, and then we will soon find the way. 
and when the full moon had risen, Hansel took his little sister by the hand and followed the pebbles, which shone like newly coined silver pieces, and showed them the way. They walked the whole night long, and by break of day came once more to their father's house. They knocked at the door, and when the woman opened it and saw that it was Hansel and Gretel, she said, You naughty children, why have you slept so long in the forest? We thought you were never coming back at all. The father, however, rejoiced, for it had caught him to the heart to leave them behind alone. Not long afterwards, there was once more great scarcity in all parts, and the children heard their mother saying at night to their father, Everything is eaten again. We have one half loaf left, and after that there is no more. The children must go. We will take them further into the woods so that they will not find their way out again. There is no other means of saving ourselves. The man's heart was heavy, and he thought it would be better for you to share the last mouthful with your children. The woman, however, would listen to nothing that he had to say, but scolded and reproached him. He who says A must say B. Likewise, and as he had yielded the first time, he had to do so a second time also. The children were, however, still awake and had heard the conversation. When the old folks were asleep, Hansel again got up and wanted to go out and pick up pebbles as he had done before. But the woman had locked the door and Hansel could not get out. Nevertheless, he comforted his little sister and said, Do not cry, Gretel. Go to sleep quietly. The good God will help us. Early in the morning came the woman and took the children out of their beds. Their bit of bread was given to them, but it was still smaller than the time before. On the way into the forest, Hansel crumbled his in his pocket and often stood still and threw a morsel on the ground. Hansel, why do you stop and look round? said the father. Go on. I am looking back at my little pigeon, which is sitting on the roof and wants to say goodbye to me, answered Hansel. Simpleton, said the woman, that is not your little pigeon. That is the morning sun that is shining on the chimney. Hansel, however, little by little, threw all the crumbs on the path. The woman led the children still deeper into the forest, where they had never in their lives been before. Then a great fire was again made, and the mother said, Just sit there, you children. And when you are tired, you may sleep a little. We are going into the forest to cut wood. And in the evening, when we are done, we will come and fetch you away. When it was noon, Gretel shared her piece of bread with Hansel, who had scattered his by the way. Then they fell asleep, and evening came and went, but no one came to the poor children. They did not wake until it was dark night, and Hansel comforted his little sister and said, Just wait. Gretel, until the moon rises, and then we will, see, we will see the crumbs of bread which I have strewn about. They will show us our way home again. When the moon came, they set out, but they found no crumbs. For the many thousands of birds which fly about in the woods and fields had picked them all up. Hansel said to Gretel, we shall soon find the way. But they did not find it. They walked the whole night and all the next day, too, from morning till evening, but they did not get out of the forest and were very hungry, for they had nothing to eat but two or three berries, which grew on the ground. And as they were so weary that their legs would carry them no longer, they lay down beneath a tree and fell asleep. It was now three mornings since they had left their father's house. They began to walk again, but they always got deeper into the forest, and if help did not come soon, they would die of hunger and weariness. When it was midday, they saw a beautiful snow-white bird sitting on a bough, which sang that so delightfully that they stood still and listened to it. And when it had finished its song, it spread its wings and flew away before them, and they followed it until they reached a little house on the roof of which it alighted, and when they came quite up to the little house, they saw that it was built of bread and covered with cakes, but the windows were of clear sugar. We will set to work on that, said Hansel, and have a good meal. I will eat a bit of the roof, and you, Gretel, can eat some of the window. It will taste sweet. 
Hansel reached up above and broke off a little of the roof to try how it tasted, and Gretel leaned against the window and nibbled at the panes. Then a soft voice cried through the room, Nibble, nibble, gnaw, who is nibbling at my little house? The children answered, The wind, the wind, the heaven-born wind, and went on eating without disturbing themselves. Hansel, who thought the roof tasted very nice, tore down a great piece of it, and Gretel pushed out the hole of one round window pane, sat down, and enjoyed herself with it. Suddenly the door opened, and a very, very old woman, who supported herself on crutches, came creeping out. Hansel and Gretel were so terribly frightened that they let fall what they had in their hands. The old woman, however, nodded her head and said, Oh, you dear children, who has brought you here? Do come in and stay with me. No harm shall happen to you. She took them both by the hand and led them into her little house. Then good food was set before them, milk and pancakes with sugar, apples and nuts. Afterwards, two pretty little beds were covered with clean white linen, and Hansel and Gretel lay down in them and thought they were in heaven. The old woman had only pretended to be so kind. She was in reality a wicked witch who lay in wait for children and had only built the little house of bread in order to entice them there. When a child fell into her power, she killed it, cooked it, and ate it, and that was a feast day with her. Witches have red eyes and cannot see far, but they have a keen scent like the beasts, and are aware when human beings draw near. When Hansel and Gretel came into her neighborhood, she laughed maliciously and said mockingly, I have them. They shall not escape me again. Early in the morning before the children were awake, she was already up. And when she saw both of them sleeping and looking so pretty with their plump red cheeks, she muttered to herself, that will be a dainty mouthful. Then she seized Hansel with her shriveled hand carried him into a little stable and shut him in with a grated door he might scream as he liked that was of no use then she went to gretel shook her till she awoke and cried get up lazy thing fetch some water and cook something good for your brother he is in the stable outside and is to be made fat when he is fat i will eat him gretel began to weep bitterly but it was all in vain. She was forced to do what the wicked witch ordered her. And now the best food was cooked for poor Hansel, but Gretel got nothing but crab shells. Every morning the woman crept to the little stable and cried, Hansel, stretch out your finger that I may feel if you will soon be fat. Hansel, however, stretched out a little bone to her and the old woman who had dim eyes could not see it and thought it was Hansel's finger and was astonished that there was no way of fattening him. When four weeks had gone by and Hansel still stayed thin, she was seized with impatience and would not wait any longer. Now Gretel, she cried to the girl, be active and bring some water. Let Hansel be fat or lean. Tomorrow I will kill him and cook him. Ah, how the poor little sister did lament when she had to fetch the water, and how her tears did flow down over her cheeks. Dear God, do help us, she cried. If the wild beasts in the forest had devoured us, at least we should have died together. Just keep your noise to yourself, said the old woman. All that won't help you at all. Early in the morning, Gretel had to go out and hang up the cauldron with the water and light the fire. We will bake first, said the old woman. I have already heated the oven and kneaded the dough. She pushed poor Gretel out to the oven, from which flames of fire were already darting. Creep in, said the witch, and see if it is properly heated so that we can shut the bread in. And once Gretel was inside, she intended to shut the oven and let her bake in it, and then she would eat her too. But Gretel saw what she had in mind and said, I do not know how I am to do it. How do you get in? Silly goose, said the old woman. 
The door is big enough. Just look, I can get in myself. And she crept up and thrust her head into the oven. Then Gretel gave her a push that drove her far into it and shut the iron door and fastened the bolt. Oh, then she began to howl quite horribly, but Gretel ran away and the witch was miserably burnt to death. Gretel, however, ran like lightning to Hansel, opened his little stable and cried, Hansel, we are saved. The old witch is dead. Then Hansel sprang out like a bird from its cage when the door is opened for it. How they did rejoice and embrace each other and dance about and kiss each other. And as they had no longer any need to fear her, they went into the witch's house. And in every corner, there stood chests full of pearls and jewels. These are far better than pebbles, said Hansel, and thrust into his pockets whatever he could get in. And Gretel said, I too will take something home with me, and filled her pinafore full. But now we will go away, said Hansel, that we may get out of the witch's forest. When they had walked for two hours, they came to a great body of water. We cannot get over, said Hansel. I see no foot plank and no bridge. And no boat crosses either, answered Gretel. But a white duck is swimming there. If I ask her, she will help us over. Then she cried, Little duck, little duck, do you see? Hansel and Gretel are waiting for you. There's never a plank or bridge in sight. Take us across on your back so white. The duck came to them, and Hansel seated himself on its back and told his sister to sit by him. No, replied Gretel, that will be too heavy for the little duck. She shall take us across one after the other. The good little duck did so, and when they were safely across and had walked for a short time, the forest seemed to be more and more familiar to them, and at length they saw from afar their father's house. Then they began to run, rushed into the parlor, and threw themselves into their father's arms. The man had not known one happy hour since he had left the children in the forest. The woman, however, was dead. Gretel emptied her pinafore until pearls and precious stones ran about the room, and Hansel threw one handful after another out of his pocket to add to them. Then all anxiety was at an end, and they lived together in perfect happiness. My tale is done. See the mouse run. Whoever catches it may make himself a big fur cap out of it. The end. The Dark History Behind Hansel and Gretel. This is from an article that I found uh, by Claire McBride on Sci-Fi Wire. So the original story of Hansel and Gretel was published by the brothers Grimm, Jacob and Wilhelm. And it was translated by Margaret Hunt in 1857 from German into English. So the dark story about Hansel and Gretel, it's about two siblings in medieval Germany and they lived during a famine. Now this famine, some believe is based on, I'm having to look this up here. Hansel and Gretel was uh, the great famine of 1315 to 1317. So the story of Hansel and Gretel was based in medieval Germany. It's about two siblings and they were basically starving. Their entire family uh, was starving during a famine. And the famine that they mention is basically inspired by the great famine of 1315 to 1317. And it's one of the biggest and most well-documented famines in medieval European history. Um, it tends to get overshadowed by the Black Death, which reached Europe in 1347. So the author of this article, Claire McBride, writes this. The Great Famine of 1315 to 1317 tends to get overshadowed by the Black Death, which reached Europe in 1347. 
but it's the first of the crises that stopped medieval Europe dead in its tracks. It was precipitated by the first rumblings of the Little Ice Age. The Little Ice Age wasn't actually an ice age, but it was called that back in 1939 and the name stuck. As glaciers expanded, temperatures in Europe cooled, leading to cooler winters, worse weather, and bad harvests. While the Little Ice Age was in full force from the 1500s to the 1800s, there are plenty of contemporary reports of bad harvests and rain starting in the spring of 1315. The success of bad harvests led to an astronomical rise in food prices for the limited supply. A moraine, a word used in medieval Europe as a catch-all for different diseases that afflict cattle, afflicted the livestock, further depleting food sources. As people began to starve, their bodies became vulnerable to disease, including the moraine from the cattle they ate, and people began to die in droves. Faced with what felt like the end of the world, some people turned to faith, others abandoned their children, and some turned to cannibalism. Historians are split on whether to take reports of cannibalism during the Great Famine of 1315 to 1317 seriously or not, given the heavy symbolism of the act. But survival cannibalism, though rare, does happen. It's certainly possible that beneath the sensationalist images of starving men dying as they dig up corpses to eat is a grain of truth. Or at least something real and scary enough to come out years later in a fairy tale. Hansel and Gretel reflects those very real fears. The idea that when famine comes, the people who are meant to care for you will fail you. Hansel and Gretel contend not only with their mother, but with their father's inability to protect them from the consequences of famine. In the fairy tale, after the children successfully kill the witch, the mother dies, suggesting a connection between the two characters, the one trying to survive by abandoning the children and the one trying to survive by eating them might be one and the same, just at different points in their desperation. No wonder Hansel and Gretel has always lent itself best to horror. It's always been rooted in that genre. The Brothers Grimm included Hansel and Gretel in the first volume of Grimm's fairy tales. According to the brothers, the story comes from Hesse, the region in Germany in which they lived. A marginal note found in the brothers' copy of the first edition of the first volume indicates that Wilhelm's wife, Henriette Dorothea Wilde contributed to their adaptation of Hansel and Gretel. It's likely the brothers heard the story from Henriette's family or even Henriette herself. The first volume was published in 1812, but the brothers made changes to their great work over the course of its publication history. The version that I just read is the final version published in 1857. In the original version, there is no rescue by duck, and their wicked stepmother is, in fact, their mother. She only became their stepmother in 1840, when the fourth edition was published. Thinking about the story, with all of that historical t context in mind, the mother abandoning her children in the face of hunger and turning angrily on her husband when he dares to protest, seems a little bit more historical but a similar tale from 1697 charles perrault's little thumb also features a couple who abandon their children in the face of hunger albeit with much heavier hearts the famines in these stories aren't fairy tale embellishments they're important pieces of place setting medieval europe was no stranger to the horrors of famine I've always enjoyed reading stories. When I was in college, way back in the day, I had to take a class. It was called Oral Interpretation. And I took it because I thought it would be an interesting way to take a speech class without having to take speech. But it was really challenging because I, a nervous speaker back then, had to stand up in front of a room of 30 people and read excerpts from literature such as poems 
stories, music lyrics, pretty much anything I could get my hands on. And I remember I had a breakthrough in that class. It was about halfway through when I was really kind of getting into the groove of being comfortable speaking in front of people. I was kind of finding my voice and I thought back to all of the stories that I used to read when I was little and I was a really big reader when I was a kid. I mean, like I would just pour through books. Uh, and one of my favorite ones was the little house on the prairie series. And yeah, that was back in the seventies. I'm really aging myself here, but that's okay. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, so I remember getting up in front of the, um, the class and reading a section of one of the chapters of one of the books. And it went on for eh, about 10 minutes, you know, and I looked up from the podium and everyone was just mesmerized by the story. And that's when I realized that the power of story and putting feeling and thought and emotion into a story can really be really moving, you know? And, uh, so I just wanted to share this, uh, not quite too spooky story on Halloween, but I was doing a little trip down memory lane and remembering all the times that I would read to my kids stories. We would cuddle up in bed and read stories. And my ultimate goal was to share a love of reading with them. And they've all pretty much become good readers and in even one an English teacher. So I'm really excited for that. So somehow it rubbed off on them. <laughs> but um, it was also, you know, just it was kind of a wind down and it was kind of a bonding thing with myself and my my kids. And it was just like quiet time and they always looked forward to, okay, now we're going to do you know, it's time for story, it's story time. And it was just a part of our ritual. Every night we did story time. A lot of times I would fall asleep in bed with them <laughs> and wake up half an hour later and creep out, tiptoe out of the bedroom and turn the lights off. But it was such a really cool thing. So um, for all of the parents out there on this Halloween, go ahead and pick up a book with your kids on Halloween night, read them a spooky story, maybe nothing too scary, but share in that moment of parenthood because it's really cool. And happy Halloween, everyone. Have a great night. Don't eat too much candy. <laughs> Have a good night.